Hello, it's Denise Fleck, the Pet Safety Crusader here. One spring morning, two dachshund pups were playfully exploring their fenced yard when Rudy caught Abigail off guard and bounded at her from behind the rose bushes. As Abby took a tumble, landing dazed and confused, a bumblebee passed her. The twosome, quickly distracted by this newfound fun, attempted to play a game of pounce with the tiny buzzing creature. Fun did ensue for a few moments, but it then turned nasty as the bee planted his stinger right on the tip of Rudy's nose. The pup pawed furiously at his face as it began to swell. Rudy started looking more like a bulldog than a dachshund. Spring has almost sprung, and there are so many things us pet parents need to keep in mind, whether we're watching other people's pets or our own, as the weather changes. However, taking a cue from behind me, just because spring is about to sprung, spring, spring, spring is about to spring, I guess that's the correct way to say it. Um, Mother Nature doesn't always follow a calendar, and we have a beautiful misty morning here, but a lot of things are starting to bloom, but we're about to get a really big storm. Um, some parts of the country are still under snow. So although today I'm going to talk about some warmer weather tips, I want to make sure you pay attention and stay alert to the weather in your area because some of those weather um, safety tips from winter may still apply to your area. Now, although things are blooming and insects are starting to buzz, um, we need to um, keep alert on our pets. And one thing I just wanted to share with you, I'll, I, for this first day of spring and our spring pet safety tips, hey Arden, thanks for joining in. I really wanted to be all perky myself today and bright, but since the weather isn't, I guess it follows suit that I'm not. And I just wanted to share that for the first time ever in my few decades on the planet. Hey Pam, thanks for joining in as well. Um, I had a migraine yesterday, wow. So it made me think about, you know, is this something our pets can experience? And my quick little bit of research on it says that there's, you know, no specific testing for it. Um, so there's no definitive results. But dogs have been known to show the same symptoms, have light sensitivity, nausea, um, and really look like they were in pain or distress. And migraine medications or drugs actually have seemed to help. So it is possible that our dogs and cats can suffer migraines just like us humans. So as everything we're always talking about, you want to really get to know your pet, know what's normal for your pet, so you can more quickly determine when something isn't quite right and get them the help they need. Gosh darn it, Tracy, all the way from Vegas, nice to have you join in too, buddy. How are you? So back on the pet safety tips, but I just wanted to share that. That's part of the reason besides the weather that I'm not so perky today. I had that first ever migraine and we now know it's something very likely that our dogs and cats experience as well. But any time of year we can have doggy dangers and cat catastrophes. So we need to be prepared. And it's just really vital that we stay brushed up on our skills. I do have a few seats left in my April 15th um, live teleconference and also in the May 20th one. So go to PetSafetyCrusader.com if it's time for you to refresh or learn for the first time. But let's talk about insects, like that little story I just told you about Rudy and Abigail bouncing on the bee. Very often it's just our human instinct to see a stinger and pull it out, whether it's on us or our pets. Well, do realize when the, the insect plants his stinger, he leaves a little toxin sac right next to it. Sometimes on us, you can actually see it pulsing. So the last thing you want to do is grab fingers or tweezers and pull, because what you're most likely to do is puncture that toxin sac. That toxin will go into the hole made by the stinger. You're going to scratch and have that terrible allergic reaction. Now, with our dogs and cats, very likely when they bounced on that buzzing creature, they felt that sting and they probably rubbed their face in the ground or they pawed at it. So very often we don't have the opportunity to remove it anyway. But should you see it on the tip of the nose or in the lip or in the paw, it's much better to scrape it away with your fingernail, a popsicle stick, a credit card, anything along those lines um, really can prevent that allergic reaction from happening. But if the toxin is in them and the swelling has started, um, a couple things you must do to help your pet. Number one, though, I've got to say, if there's any breathing difficulty whatsoever, hey, Amber, nice of you to join in. 
Um, sorry about my hair today. I didn't wash it. Amber did a beautiful job on my hair recently. And today, I, I shouldn't say I didn't wash it. I didn't straighten it. So it's a frizzy day and that's what it is. But anyway, first thing you want to do is, um, I see you talking about my hair and stuff. Every, the, the, the content went right out the window. But you want to make sure that if there's any breathing difficulties, that you get your pet to the vet right away. Dogs and cats, just like humans, can be highly allergic to insect toxin and can go into anaphylactic shock. Basically, that's a severe allergic reaction. Most of the time, not all of the time, but most of the time our pets do get bitten on the face because they're snapping at those buzzing bees. So um, what's very likely as well with that anaphylaxis is their tongue could start to swell and that would make it really difficult for you to even give rescue breathing um, if the need be. So, any breathing difficulty, hightail it to the veterinarian. Also, if there's an extreme amount of swelling, you want to get there as well. But if you have basically a healthy pet that has just been stung by one bee, not multiples, not a swarm, what you're going to want to administer is Benadryl. Diphenhydramine is the generic form. And if you are getting Benadryl or, you know, any other type of over-the-counter med to give your pet, always check with your veterinarian first. Wise thing to do. Um, don't give it if he's on any other medication or has health conditions. And make sure it doesn't have acetaphenamin, um, pseudophedrine, or cetirizine. Cetirizine is often given to dogs, but never in conjunction with diphenhydramine. So you just want to make sure those uh, other ingredients aren't in the Benadryl. You also don't want to give time-released ones. What I prefer if you can find them are the gel caps, the ones that have the liquid in the gel, and you can pierce it with a straight pin, squirt it right under the tongue, and it actually, when anything goes into the system sublingual, meaning under the tongue, it actually gets into the system much more quickly, or I should say into the bloodstream, than if it has to go through the stomach and be digested. Some veterinarians feel um, the speed of that is negligible, but when we're trying to prevent, you know, swelling and other side effects to our pup or our kitten, um, any few extra seconds um, can mean a lot. Gosh, so many of you joining in this morning. Good to see you, Melanie, Cindy, Paul as well. So Benadryl is the one step, and then the other one is to add a cold pack to reduce any swelling. It might be the bag of frozen peas out of your refrigerator or the mixed vegetables, whatever it happens to be. Um, it might be those kind that are filled with rice or different kinds of beads, but you don't want it to be too cold and you don't want to leave it on for an extended period of time because we can actually create frostbite if we do. So I generally have what I call my 30 second rule, but I extend it a little bit. Say 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. And generally within 40 minutes to an hour, you have a very sleepy pet who's no longer pawing at the swelling and all is good with the world because when our pets are healthy and happy, our life as well is, you know, is good as well. But like I said, with any kind of insect sting, and there's so many others we can talk about, you know, including spiders down to jellyfish and scorpions and the whole bit, and a lot of them are handled quite differently. But, um, you know, you just want to make sure that if there's any kind of breathing difficulty or unusual amount of swelling, you get to the vet. Now, something else that can, oh my gosh, Deborah Joe, we have been meaning to video chat forever. Glad to see you. This is just like having morning coffee with my friends today. I love it. I absolutely love it. And why don't you guys tell me what your weather is like there? We're actually expecting some rain, a lot of wind, and they say tornadoes, but hopefully, knock on wood, um, they're going to pass us by. Some of you, I think, have some hot weather. I think California is actually going to get a lot of rain, too. So keep me posted, everyone. But um, I just wanted to bring up that about insects. Also, it's so important that we keep our pets well-groomed um, every time of the year, but especially as it's getting warmer. We want to make sure they're free of fleas and ticks, that there are none of those parasites there bothering our best buddies, but that we never shave their fur down because the fur really insulates from the, the temperature. It also can serve as a barrier for burrs and foxtails and um, thorns and things protecting our pets. We still need to always look our pets over for those foxtails and other things along those lines. But the fur is important, but we need to brush the kitty and brush the puppy and make sure they stay well groomed. Ah, 44 and cool breezes in Vegas. Hey, buddy, I'm heading your way in October, Tracy. Um, something you guys may not know about that I wanted to mention, because uh, with ticks, we generally hear about Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Lyme disease, ehrlichiosis, 
but you may not have ever heard of cytozoonosis, and that's something that can affect our kitty cats. It's actually also known as bobcat fever, and it's obviously generally for the outdoor cats, but don't be fooled. Those of you with indoor cats can get fleas and can get ticks. They can cross the threshold. They can come in on our clothing on another pet, so it's something to be very wary of. Um, cytozoonosis is caused by the Lone Star tick and the um, American dog tick, and the problem with it is the kitties go down really quick with it. Um, it prevents the blood from actually flowing to the tissues and they suffer organ failure. So it's just important that we do those regular checkups of our pet, looking for those lumps and bumps, but also looking for the parasites. Um, what you might notice with the cat is high fever, um, they might feel depressed and lethargic and they may stop eating. Although those symptoms can be, you know, a bazillion different um, ailments. So just, you know, do your head to tail checkups like I'm always talking about. Even when you have an indoor cat, just always be on the lookout for something that isn't quite right. Uh, I also want to remind you to stay up to date with your various vaccinations or your titer tests, whichever you and your veterinarian think is best for your pet. You know, I'm a huge advocate of not over vaccinating pets. So I like those titer tests, those blood tests that are really only the, the only true guarantee that a pet is immune to a disease. Basically one out of every thousand pets is a non responder and they don't do what they're supposed to do. Um, when they get the vaccination. The vaccination or the antigen is injected into the body. And as I used to tell my high school animal care students, think of them as little soldiers in your body and that when the injection or the antigen enters, they are given the proper weapon to fight off whatever disease they're protecting against. Very often our systems can still fight off without vaccines, but um, that really primes them. The thing is we're often giving our pets these vaccinations much too frequently and it is causing other issues. But, you know, if you check with your veterinarian, find a veterinarian you truly trust, don't give all the vaccinations at once. Spread them apart several weeks at a time. That can be very, very beneficial. And also try to find ones that are more natural in their makeup, that they don't have a lot of preservatives and certainly not thimerosal or certain types of um, chemicals that are actually more at risk of causing problems than the vaccine itself. So do keep up with the vaccinations and heartworm testing. If you go back, um, all of these Facebook Live videos now are on my YouTube page, The Sunny Dog, or you can scroll through the Facebook page and find them. But on March 1st, I really covered heartworms rather well. And this is the, the time, this is the season. And as I told all of you, it's not just the Southeast anymore. Heartworm has gone all the way to the West Coast. So if you see a mosquito, your pet certainly better be on heartworm medications. But it's important that they get tested for heartworms before you start the medicine, or that can actually be a real problem. Because once a dog starts on heartworm treatment, you actually have to keep him very calm because as the heartworms start to break down, you don't want movement going around or the um, heartworms that are being shed can actually clog in the lungs and the heart and in the arteries. So very, very important. So go back to the March 1st one to remind yourselves about that. But I just then again want to tell you that even though it's not looking like the temperatures are rising for me today, I know they are for some of you. Hey, Norma. Hey, Martha. Hey, Scott. Thanks for joining in. This is a popular day. Um, do remember to provide your pets with plenty of shade and water. Um, if you have an outside water bowl for your pet, make sure it's hooked up to a spigot and it's in a shady area so that it keeps refilling. Don't just get a great big bowl or use um, a wading pool because then birds are going to use it as a bird bath and that water is now going to be contaminated for your dog. Make sure cats are drinking. Cats can be notoriously bad drinkers. A lot of people just give them kibble and they have a water bowl. Some cats don't like drinking out of water near their bowls, but very oftentimes the bowls are uncomfortable for their whiskers. Remember, whiskers are kitty radar. And if the whiskers are touching, um, it's uncomfortable to them. It kind of triggers that it's too small of a space or an uncomfortable space for a cat to go into. So your cat might enjoy drinking out of a glass or a wine glass or a coffee mug or a fancy teacup, whatever it happens to be. But keep trying until you find that it works and that you keep your pets well hydrated. And then, of course, um, there's all the plants. 
And we can go on and on about this. And since we're only starting spring, we're going to cover a lot more of this in detail. But I just wanted to kick it off and give you a few tips today. If you go to petpoisonhelpline.com, there's some great handouts about plants. And obviously, this is a number you guys need to have queued into your cell phones um, in case you ever need them. So that's an important thing to know about. But um, with Easter coming, and I'm going to be coming to you live from the Georgia House Rabbit Society on the 29th. So we're going to talk about rabbits and Easter. But I just want to remind you about a lot of the spring plants, in particular lilies. Any part of the lily, of true lilies, um, hemorrhocallus or lilium um, can be poisonous to our cats. They can actually be fatal. As few as two petals or two leaves. Um, you'll see drooling and nausea and it will cause organ failure, kidney in particular. Dogs, um, lilies just generally cause stomach upset and we don't want that to happen to our dogs. But do know that lilies can be fatal. A lot of people here are now planting the bulbs. Make sure the dogs don't dig them up and eat the bulbs. They have toxins in them as well. So many of our plants do. I was going to look. I printed out a list for you. The top 10 most poisonous plants to our pets are the autumn crocus, the azalea. And boy, they're just starting to bloom here. They're beautiful, but there's a lot of them where I'm living. So that's something, you know, I'm lucky that haiku doesn't go after plants, but I'm going to keep a watch on him. Cyclamen, daffodils, tulips, hyacinth, anything with the bulbs, diffenbachia, the leaves and the stems in particular, calancho. And remember, if you cut any of these and put them in a base, that water is toxic too. So if the cat you don't think is going to ever eat a lily, but if she might come to that base and drink the water simply because, like I was talking about, she might be more comfortable drinking out of something like a vase or a vase. Um, then out of her water bowl, because her whiskers wouldn't be touching, that could certainly be problematic. All the lilies, and here in particular, tiger, Asiatic, Easter, and Japanese snow can be fatal to cats, while others would cause milder symptoms. Oleander, my friend's back on the West Coast. Um, also, you never want to burn oleander when you cut the clippings. Never throw that into your fireplace, because that smoke is toxic from that. And then the sago palm, um, the seeds are very, very deadly. So keep that in mind as you guys are starting to garden. Always check things out. And please take care with snail and slug bait killers and um, all kinds of weed killers and fertilizers. If it says organic, that doesn't still mean that it was meant to go inside of your pet. A real popular organic fertilizer is blood meal. It's flash frozen, ground up blood from generally um, cattle. And obviously that smell is enticing to our canine friends, but what it actually can do is form a clump like concrete in their stomach. So make sure that you get pet and wildlife friendly products. Um, a great weed killer that I know of is a gallon water, two cups Epsom salt, and a quarter cup Dawn or other dish soap. Mix that all together, pour it on your weeds, and in the morning you just have to pick up the remnants of them. So, you know, think about these things more and more as we're starting to get into our, um, our, our spring season, not just with weed killers, but fertilizers as well. Because when our pens, pets walk across the ground, anything that isn't absorbed through their paws is going to be ingested when they groom themselves, and it can be deadly. Um, that also goes with those snail and slug bait pellets. Manufacturers generally spray them with molasses or salt, which is very enticing to our four-legged best friends. But, um, you know, that's, it's supposed to attract the snails and slugs, but it's also attracting our pets. And uh, a dog that um, consumes snail and slug bait pellets can have seizures, tremors that may even last for days, if not worse. So remember, poisoning is relative. What's going to kill a chihuahua may have no effect on a Great Dane, but we just want to be so careful and not cause any harm to our pets while we're trying to make nature more beautiful around us. So everybody, no matter if you have a beautiful misty day like I do today, a beautiful warm and sunny day, or if you're still under snow, start thinking about what you can do to make sure that the season ahead is going to be beautiful, safe, healthy, and happy for you and your best friends. I look forward to talking to you Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern, where I'm going to talk about aromatherapy as a wellness tool and also as a calming aid for our dogs. And in particular, I'm going to share some great products from my good pal, Vicki Ray Thorne and Earth Heart Inc. So I look forward to seeing you then. And until then, have an awesome, possum week. Bye-bye for now.